Hey everyone, welcome back to Private Club Radio. I'm your host, Denny Corby. Thanks for listening in. I have a cool episode. I get to chat with Steve Graves of Creative Golf Marketing. He is a really funny gentleman, a real seasoned pro in the industry, been around for years, knows his stuff. And he and I had a really fun chat. And this episode is a little delayed in getting out. And he and I just met for the first time. So I got to hang out with him for a little bit in Omaha. got to see him speak and uh, transform the room. But no, it really brought some uh, golden nuggets and nuggets of information that are really valuable. So I know that you all, the listeners, are going to enjoy this episode as well. So please help me welcome my new friend in person, (laughs) Steve Graves. I'm getting a, a number of clubs are coming to the realization that uh, the pandemic has concluded. Uh, the uh, we're getting back to what you know, I don't I don't know where we're going to get back to what really normal is, but uh, the, the consumer no. is is not as consumed with uh, you know playing golf or being a member of a club as they were when they were sequestered, you know, at home you know, during COVID with no place else to go. And that yeah. has made a, you know, and, and, uh, you know, kind of as I, you know, put in my notes, you know, clubs, it's really surprising how many clubs aren't realistic. You know, it'd be like, you know, I, I tell the, you know, that one of the jokes that I tell is if, if you owned a gas station and it was two miles off the interstate, And they decided to do Mm -hmm. some construction on the interstate. And for two years, the, they, they routed all the traffic by your gas station. And I called you up and I go, Hey, Danny, how you doing? You're going, Oh, this is unbelievable. This it's just, it's unbelievable. I mean, every day I'm, this is more business I've ever done in my life. And then lo and behold, the construction concludes. And they reroute everybody back to the interstate. And I call you up and I go, how you doing? And you go, I don't know where everybody went. <laughs> and, and there's clubs who, who literally, Denny, are convinced that their club was the reason everybody showed up. And not an artificial, inf- you know, influencing, you know, position. And like, like I said, you know, kind of in my notes and, and you, you could all of a sudden at that, at your gas station that you own, you could start charging $25 to use the restroom. I mean, you, you could charge, you know, a hundred dollars for a donut because there's no place else for anybody to go. Now they may grumble a little bit, but they're going to pay you the $25 and all of a sudden the rerouting occurs and nobody will pay you for the, your restroom. And as a matter of fact, they're mad at you. Uh, and yeah. Anyway, <laughs> you know, the, the, the difficulty for me, Danny, uh, is, and you, you know, we, we kind of shared with each other, you know, listen, we're both type A, I, I, I watch your, uh, your videos and, and went on your website and boy, you're a talented guy. Congratulations on how, how, how good, how good you are at your craft. That's, that's exciting. It, it's re- really impressive. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, and. I mean, we're, we're all in the entertainment business to us. I mean, and private clubs in my judgment haven't really come to that conclusion. And, you know, the, and the toughest thing about being in in the consultants industry, particularly my side is I I have to be the guy who says, don't get too happy now. Don't, you know, don't, I've got general managers going, why can't you just say, be supportive of how great it is. And I said, because it's artificial, it's, it's, it's going to change, you know? And so you hate to be kind of the sour grapes guy, you know, that, cause I'm a, I'm a, I'm an eternal optimist. If you yeah. put me in a room full of manure, I think there's a couple of ponies in there somewhere. And, uh, at the same time, I'm also a realist having done this for 33 years and watched, you know, after September 11th, after the downturn in the economy at the stock market, you know, watching the cycles. And I don't think a lot of clubs are realizing how cyclical this is. So kind of just, uh, you know, I, I, I probably gave you just 15 minutes of, you know, what, what your interview 
No, because I think what, you know, today we're going to talk a little bit, probably more about the, you know, strategic planning um, in golf clubs is pretty much what I well, took away actually, from that, right? I'm, I'm actually somewhat, uh, what strategic planning is what everybody's invested in. They haven't invested in strategic marketing. Is you know, if 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 you build, I, I kind of use the amusement park analogy. You can build, you know, the greatest rides, but if there's not somebody there to sell the tickets, if there's not somebody there to be nice to you, you come in. If there's not somebody there to put you on the ride, etc., doesn't mean everybody's going to show up and ride the rides. You, you have to also tell the people that you've built the ride, tell them how exciting the ride is, tell them how much fun they're going to have. Because because if they ride the ride, it's only going to be two and a half minutes and the ride's over. Uh, they're not going to pay $100 for the experience of the day. So the, the, the overused phrase of if you build it, they will come is what most clubs are using in their strategic planning. They just feel if they make changes to put in new pickleball courts or put in a new fitness center, that that will magically have people show up without telling anybody about it. Well, because they're a private club and well, not supposed to be known what's going on. It's got to be secretive. But, but you're right. What, <laughs> what clubs commonly push back, Denny, is marketing is, is, a, is a show of desperation. And so if we market or they'll say, you know, we're a not-for-profit you know, organization, we cannot advertise, which is a, which is a false statement. But so, yeah, we, we deal with all that all the time. And that these uh, assumptions that are incorrect. What advice do you have then to, for like, you know, and if, you know, for effective or for effective, uh, for effective, you know, strategic marketing, I mean, you know, let's, let's get straight brass tacks. You know, what's, what are some things clubs are doing bad that they you have know, to a stop? Lot of it, uh, listen, everybody's out there doing a great job of talking to clubs and educating boards about governance. Uh, Copland, Keebler, and Wallace, the best in the industry out there. You've, you've already interviewed, you know, them numerous times. And so they're doing a great job of educating boards that instead of being operationally govern, you know, operational governance, in other words, the guy shows up, I'm on the grounds and greens committee, and I've been out on the golf course and I suggest that you, you know, let's go mow this and that. Instead, they come to the board meeting and say, I'm ahead of the grounds and greens committee. And I'm dissatisfied with the condition of the golf course. And so I'm governing, governing you by telling you, I want those standards raised, but I'm not going to operationally tell you how to do it. So they've done a phenomenal job. I think there's the education, Danny, of the same thing that's educating boards. And the, hopefully, you know, exactly what your podcast does is the, the many people who listen to it, listen to it, say, Oh my gosh, we, this, this has been helpful to us to understand that it's okay to, in fact, market the club. It's okay to say to the members, we'd like to encourage you to sponsor a friend. It's okay to design collateral materials. Uh, you know, Denny, I'm working with some of the most elite clubs in the country. And let's say that you were a member of one of those clubs and my wife, Nancy, and I were good friends of yours. And I said, hey, Denny, I'm in. But do you, do you have any collateral materials that you can share with me that I could show to Nancy? And you go out to the club and they go, no, I mean, we don't. Why would we have those? And you come back to me and go, no, Steve, you know, they, they, you know, they said you could look at the website. Yeah, Denny, we've done that. But it doesn't talk about your kids' programs or what there are for women. And so, you know, your point is, is hey, I, I, Steve, I asked. And my point to you is. You know what, Danny? I'm in a negotiation here with my wife, and I I need some of these things I'm asking for. And if the club can't provide them, it's going to be much more difficult. There's lots of clubs that have extraordinary stories that they're just not telling. This is me just chatting out loud, and it's not even about having like let's just say it's a thousand of those packets. You can you can only you oh, only yeah. need maybe a hundred. You know, and and it's just you know you're not going to give them to everybody, but there's going to be that one person who you know is just going to appreciate that tangible thing. I think that's, you know, for me, from from my point of view, you know, and then you could kind of either say yay or nay, but to me that is strategic marketing because it's just having little things ready for specific personality types or specific types of members to where, 
hey, this member might like this, but it's, hey, have you really thought about just having like a hundred of these little packets made for these special people? And it's like, you know, that's going to help well, click it, and, and Danny, make a sale. Uh, you're you're hundred percent correct. And uh, it, it, it doesn't take much to recognize the age difference between the two of us. I tend to be someone who would like to see it in print. Uh, my son who works for us and does all the graphic design said, hey, dad, this technology thing, it's not a fad. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of here. So y- you, Denny, as a young man, you would prefer to see it in a digital form. You'd like to see a flipping book, you know, that I could just send you a link and you could, in fact, you know, go on there and take a look at it. So don't, you don't even necessarily yeah. need to have a hundred printed ones. You could just simply have a digital link yeah. that a person could instantaneously send to a friend. And But Denny, a lot, and not everybody, I, I certainly can't paint with, you know, too broad of a brush. Uh, the vast majority of clubs are not very proficient at that. Yeah. Well, and then I think that's a whole conversation is going back to sales and, or going to sales and yeah. all the, that whole other process. But, um, do you see any, any, any trends? I grew up again. I, 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 for the last time I'll say I'm 67 and I grew up where there was only three TV channels. There were not all these, you know, other, all these things that were, uh, competitors of our time and private clubs, Danny were the gold standard of everything in their community. They had the best golf course the best tennis courts, sometimes the only tennis courts. They had the best pool. They had the best food and beverage operation. They had one of the stories I love to tell you is in, back in, in the in 1980s, I was the general manager of my club in Kansas. You live in Pennsylvania and Scranton and I live in, I live in Kansas. So I've lived in this town since 1980, 43 years. I was the pro from 1980 to 1992 general manager in there in between. So I was out with some friends of mine who were members back in the eighties. And this guy says to me, Steve, remember when you were the general manager, the country club was packed. Everybody was having fun. And I said, we had the only liquor license in town. He goes, oh yeah, I forgot about that. (laughs) So when a, a long answer to a very short, fair question, Clubs are no longer the gold standard. I was just, you know, talking to, uh, well, actually it was Tom Wallace with Compliment Keebler. And we were talking about, uh, excuse, I was talking to Jeffrey Kreefel, the general manager of Congressional, about QR codes. And he said, hmm. you know, Steve, we have a couple of our venues at Congressional where we do have QR codes, but, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of the, uh, you know, if they want to, grab something at the turn, you know, they can go on the QR codes. And his exact words were, the private club industry is behind every industry as it comes to technology. So we went from the gold standard to every affluent consumer to continuing to talk about whether you should take your hat off in the clubhouse, whether, you know, what, whether you should have a collared shirt on or not. They're still talking about fixing and repairing bowl marks rather than pro- the promotion of a technology and how it can be used at clubs to enhance the experience. And so you, you got to understand that the most of the people in the boardroom are not your age. So they're not, they're not techno- technologically savvy. They're uh, not excited about it. Uh, you know, you, you bring up chat GPT in the boardroom and you'll just get blank stares. You bring up AI. That's again, that's being too broad brushed, but there won't be a lot of enthusiasm. Of course. When you and I both know. I was chatting with uh, Peter um, from Concert Golf Partners and, you know, we were talking about the same thing, how boardrooms will have conversations about the the burger buns for 30, 45 minutes because, you know, there's a whole thing. Oh, we switched them in the the sesame seed on this aren't toasted at, and it's like, you know, well not, you know, same thing as, you know, it's, it's being a little, a little excessive, but it's like the same, same difference. You can be taking that time and being so much more productive. And, you know, it's funny how you get these people who can be on boards of other very successful businesses and do great, but then you get them in this 
private club world and they just uh well you know you know the there's there uh, you yeah. probably have heard this before but Bob Deadman was the founder of uh Club Corp you know one of the really dynamic mm-hmm. uh management companies in the United States probably arguably behind Troon right now but still very prominent and Bob Deadman had a one of the best phrases ever 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 stated Denny he said the private club business is run like nobody's business because it's nobody's business and <laughs> we've, you know, we challenge people all the time in the boardroom. And I'm, I know Peter does And the cop. The point is, is Mr. Corby or Dr. Corby, is this how you would run your business? Is, are you making the decisions right now? And their answer always is no. And they, they acknowledge it, but they don't, there's really not the thorn in the boardroom of the club as a business. And that now it, it clearly you know, has a, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily need, needed to be extremely profitable. It needs to be profitable, but, but, if there, you know, the attention to the tail of food costs is not as important. Uh, if you run a Red Robin restaurant, you need to be looking at your food costs because you don't have any dues coming in. You don't have all these other ancillary, you know, elements. But uh, you see when that, and I've had the privilege of being in over 1,600 boardrooms. And when that boardroom door closes, it's startling the statements that are made by talented businessmen and businesswomen who run some of the largest organizations in the world and how diametrically opposed their decisions are because they think of it more almost a hobby. It's kind of a toy. It's kind of fun. It's really not yours. So you really can't mess it up. So it's like, ah, it's right. (laughs) It's, 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 it's a little bit like driving a rental car. You know, you, you, when you, you, it's, oh, you, you're driving a nice one, but if you run over a curb, eh, not your car. You're going to floor it a little bit more than normal. You're going to hit those brakes a little bit harder than you might, you know, you're going to put into sport mode. You're going to yeah, rip it. I don't, you know, I don't know if these analogies are perfect or not, but, but there, there, there's a, there's an angle of, of uh, truth, you know, to it. No question. And, you know, that's, you know, when, when we were talking earlier about uh, clubs look at marketing as being desperate. They feel as though their product should stand on its own two feet, that people should, you know, the other thing that most people don't understand is that when people before, for, for instance, you know, you see my shirt, I just happened to put this on. It, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, maybe it was subliminal that I wanted to say to you, hey, you see my Augusta National shirt? You know, you don't, you don't see very many logoed shirts anymore, Denny, unless they're from Baltus Rawl, Pebble Beach, Dustin National. But, you know, just to have a logo, and I won't name any clubs because I don't want to demean, you know, but just, you know, the club of in, in the town that you live in, they're not as prominent uh, because, because being a member of a private club is not as aspirational as it once was. It no longer showed the success that you've enjoyed and or demonstrated that success where people literally sat at their desk in their hometowns and romanticized getting the heck out of the office and getting, you know, to the club. One of my jokes when I was the golf professional was Wednesday, men's day, all the doctors, I said, you know, if you're going to ever break your arm, make sure you break your arm on Wednesday out at the country club. Because that's where all the doctors are. There's no doctor, you know, anyplace else, but, you know, at the country club on Wednesday. Well, the one of the professions that is the that's least, funny. Uh, has the least number of members joining it right now, doctors. They, they, they're, they're no longer, they're, they're having to be more businessmen and businesswomen, be more bottom line oriented. And they're not as prominent of availability of taking off as they were, as they were back in the seventies, eighties and nineties. I feel now like when you go to the doctor, it's not like when I was a kid, like they had their own practices. Now it's part of like a guy, it gets part of all these other bigger ones. And like, there's just not that homey feel. So you're like, oh, like, you know, at least like you would go to like the doctor. Like, I, you know, I, I remember like when I, when I was younger, it was like a homey feel. Like you'd walk in. Oh, it wasn't like, sit down, please. What's your oh. copay? Can, let me get your number. Okay. But um, eh. like it's a, it wasn't as transactional it was a little bit more, you know, and you're dealing with like your body and health. So it was like, 
you almost kind of want that a little bit. Like, cause now, you know, like we, we, uh, we're going to Africa, uh, me and my family. So, uh, we had to get like all these shots and stuff. And like, just when you go in there, it's just so like robotic. Well, that's what, you know, like, listen, I'm, I'm the bum of my family. My father is a physician, but he was a general practitioner and then he became an emergency physician and he loved being a general practitioner because he, he knew the Corby family. He delivered all the babies. He, he knew the mom and dad. They would sit down. He became an emergency physician and he loved his profession, but he hated the fact that he would get counseled by the hospital. He'd stayed too long with that patient. He needed to get back and, you know, he needed to get to the next guy. Mm. He needed to get, you know, on to the next, you know, bottom line. My brother's a doctor at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, now he's retired now, but was a doctor at the Mayo Clinic. And, you know, I mean, there can't be, there's no better clinic there is, but he became a bit disenchanted with the fact that there was no longer the sitting bedside manner of, so Danny, tell me about your trip to Africa. Tell me, you know, tell me about, it was, sorry, got to go. And the private club industry, that's one of my arguments is, is that they've invested so much into capital, but they have not invested into staff members. So when I show up at private clubs, Danny, I could start taking artwork off the walls and chairs out of the foyer and taking them out to my car and nobody would say a word because there's nobody there. There's nobody there to say, welcome. Not only just why are you taking the pictures, it's welcome to the club. Who are you here to see? Nice to see you again. Or as I leave, say hi to Nancy. How are the kids? Hope you'll be here tomorrow. So they've overinvested in capital, but strategic marketing with regard to the intrinsic side of, you know, people. Now, remember in that boardroom, those board members don't need to be coddled. They are, they, they, they think about the club every day. They're at the club every single day. They're not the average member. The average member uses the club occasionally and needs someone to say, you know, if, if as you're walking out of the club, Good to see you, Mr. Corby. You know, hey, I hope you had a good time today. And even if you turn around and say, you know, I struggled getting the cup of coffee I desired. Thank you, Mr. Corby. I'm so glad you told me that. I'll take care of that. Versus you just getting in your car and being upset that you couldn't get the cup of coffee to take home with you. So they're, they're over-invested in capital and tragically under-invested, you know, in staffing, uh, you know, and that personal side, you know, of, of the relationship uh, that is that is so critical. Staffing, exactly. training, and leadership. I mean, it, it, it's really, we could be talking about a dentist office. We could be talking about a doctor. We could be talking about any, uh, you know, well-run and high-profile, or excuse me, high-performing business. But the private club industry has just felt that it, it was so powerful on its own that it really didn't need these type of investments. Uh, it didn't really need to cater to the the negatively trending member. It didn't really need to, uh, because everybody that's a high performing member, high utilizing member, assumes that everybody thinks about the club like they do. I mean, think about your profession. Uh, you know, you... Uh, have a lot of people in the audience who are there for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and uh, for my, my son, who's now a pilot, our oldest son, who's a pilot for Southwest Airlines, is an amateur magician. And, and he loved magic. He loved magic as a kid. Yeah. So, you know, we would, every magic store, we'd, every, every town we'd go into, Denny, it'd be like going to, a, to a, uh, a baseball card store. He'd go, hey, could we go by the magic shop? And yep. so he'd get the disappearing nickel or, you know, all these things. So if we went to see your... Uh, professional show, he'd be there out of excitement. Now, I might go, you know, as another person, and Nancy and I just happen to be in Scranton, and you're doing, you know, the show, and we're just looking for something to do, and we're a little ambivalent. You know, we we paid the price, and it's kind of, hey, entertain us. You know, so there's these different levels of people that you deal with every day. And you know it before you walk up to that pi to that microphone, and you understand 
listen, every boardroom I go into, Danny, you know who the first guy I look for? Bad body language. The first guy I look for, and that's the guy I, I want to know his name. I want to greet him. I want to talk to him. I suppose you use similar tactics. But the guy who shakes my hand and mm -hmm. says, we're so glad you're here. I don't need to sell him. I need to, you know, sell the guy who, you know, walks in that says, I don't know why we got, why we got this consultant in here. You know, we've already got a membership director. You know, what does he know that we, she doesn't know? You, I'm sure you do that every show you do. Yep. Yep. And it's just that little bit of extra caring, that little bit of just putting the pieces together and realizing the bigger game that's at play. So a lot of what we're talking about are, are small pieces of a big puzzle or mosaic Boy, they're all, they all make an impact. And I'll, I'll say it again. I think there's a, a vast underinvestment, you know, in just the concept of marketing, uh, enough staff members to pay attention to a, a larger group of people while they're there at the club in a larger group of people. One of the most impressive things I ever had was when I got a phone call at my house and the golf professional didn't ask for me. They asked for our son and, and reminded him, didn't, didn't remind my wife, didn't remind me. They said to my son, Hey, don't forget junior golf tour. I'd love to see you there. You think he didn't hang the phone up with the biggest smile on his face? So, you know, the guy made the right call. He didn't just call my wife and say, don't forget to bring the boy up. Yeah, called call the boy. Up. And her, and most importantly, <laughs> one guy, uh, the uh, golf professional who was a mentor of mine, drank a case of Paps Blue Ribbon every day. A case. When I would walk into the pro shop, I would hear, Ch -ch -ch -ch. and so he took me aside, Danny, and he said to me, you know, Steve, I got a little problem. And I said, I, I, no, I Figure that out. And he goes, but I've figured out the industry. He, he'd been the pro for 20 years. I go, what, what's the secret? He says, you take care of kids and you take care of women. Now that was back in the seventies and he was right in the seventies and he's right in the, in the 2023s. But most people take care of the guy and strategic marketing says, Hi, Mrs. Corby. I don't need to talk to Danny. I already got him. He, he, I, yeah. Hey, Danny, I did a, I did a session for the Club Management Association of America. And the name of the session was No Man Has Ever Quit a Private Club. Do you think your, you, can you imagine you ever going home to your wife and saying, Hey, honey, I've been thinking about it. How much are we really using the club? That's always the spouse and whether it's a male spouse, a female spouse, I don't care whoever, whatever spouse it is. I don't care. Yeah. But it's always the non-using spouse who is talking about whether they're, whether the price they're paying and the entertainment they're getting is proportional, no different than any time they go to a comedy show that you have. You got somebody who's pushing back saying, is this worth the ticket price? Mm hmm. And then it's saying, especially at clubs, because you get the same thing, you know, so about like most of my businesses is, is private clubs, about about two thirds. So the same thing, like, you know, you have the people who are there, they're excited. They watch the videos. They came to see the show. You have others. It's they're you know, the the the, the wife's going because right. the husband loves magic. He's like, oh, OK, here we go. Then you have. Yeah, you, you just. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, you know, so if you go into that strategic marketing, they're just not realizing the vast diversity that consumer, I don't mean diversity by race, creed, color, religion. I'm just talking about just how they view the club as a part of their life and whether, you know, and, and how important it is and trying to make it as important as they possibly can for, you know, all consumers. But I know one thing, if the kids have a great time, at junior goal and the spouses, regardless of which one they are, have a great time. The highest using spouse is never going to get the phrase. 
is this really worth the money? Well, because, you know, if the kids all of a sudden equate the club to fun, it's never going to be no. an issue to get them to go there. E even if there is a, even if there is a dress code, they're excited to go. And, you know, it, and this is where marketing Correct. isn't just pamphlets. Like, it's not just like that physical thing that we were talking about earlier. It's this expands so much further. And if you have more activities at the club that the kids enjoy, now, if you have to go pick the kids up from the club for whatever reason, you're more likely to stay there and have a meal Correct. because you're already there. And the kid, I don't want to leave or, you know, whatever. Or it's, you might even get takeout. So you might not even eat there, but maybe, oh, hey, since we're already picking up, Timmy, why don't we just pick up dinner too? And it, it, exactly. And, and even saying that to the members and saying, listen, we know how busy your day is. When you pick up Johnny and, Johnny and Jill at the club today, if you want to just, you know, give us a 30 minute notice, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make dinner for you to take home. So you don't have to have, you don't have to make dinner. But if that, if that premise is not proffered, you know, then you just pick up, you know, Jimmy and, you know, Johnny and Jill at the club, you got to mm -hmm. go home and that spouse still needs to make dinner. As opposed to even just the offer, you know, of it, you know, is, but you're, but as small as the teams are, Danny, they don't have the chance to sit and talk these types of strategies. They're typically overwhelmed, understaffed. So they're, they're just taking, putting out the fires of each day and the upcoming member guest and things of that nature. I'm very passionate about the industry, lots of subjects. And so, no, we, all I want to do is have something that benefits your uh, listeners interest, you know, is not to sell anything that I've got. I just like to help educate, you know, give some thought, no, no different when you're sitting in church and they yeah. go through a variety of subjects. And, you know, commonly they talk about being a better husband, being a better dad, being, being a better person. Uh, and you know, you find yourself thinking, man, that I hadn't thought about this or I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. And so I, I just hope we hit a few subjects that are helpful to you and uh, you know, might be of interest to your, uh, but if you're ever interested in any specific subject, uh, I'm certainly not shy, uh, with, per with, or as it pertains to, you know, trying to come up with a scenario that's beneficial to you and your listeners. Hope you all enjoyed that episode. I know Steve is a really great guy. Well, now I know after I talked to him in person and then did the episode, but, uh, super, super fun. Really enjoyed that link up with him on LinkedIn, Steve Graves. Um, or check him out on his website, creativegolfmarketing.com. As always, appreciate any likes, reviews, subscribes. Catch you on the next. Catch you on the flippity flip. The flippity flip. The flippity flop. Stop till you drop. Bop, bop.